Hello, I'm Beverly Hatcherimbu of Development Gateway. This is our deep dive on the Nigeria fertilizer sector. All the things you didn't know you needed to know about fertilizer you are about to learn at the hands of our expert, Sam, who was our key partner here at the International Fertilizer Development Center. Um, so FIFA, the Visualizing Insights for Fertilizer in African Agriculture, um, has been a multi-year program in Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria, really looking at how we can take available data and make it more accessible, and make it more available, um, and particularly make it more visually appealing to encourage use by a variety of stakeholders to make key decisions in driving, ultimately in driving improved agriculture production across Africa. So I'm sitting here with Sam today, and we're going to talk a little bit about Nigeria. Like why Nigeria, in some ways, even within Africa, is a unique fertilizer market. Um, so Sam, why don't you talk a little bit about like who um, IFPC is, the International Fertilizer Development Center, and what your role is. My name is Samuel Ali. I am the fertilizer market analyst for Nigeria. I also double as the West African coordinator for the African Fertilizer Watch. IBC is the International Fertilizer Development Center, an organization set up to actually develop the fertilizer space in most of the African countries. Uh, under the APO project, which is the African Fertilizer.org initiative, it's an initiative set up to improve accessibility to data and improve availability of data. Uh, ATO tends to collate data that is scattered here and there and put it together in a usable form. Out of curiosity, how did you get into working in and focusing on the fertilizer sector? Oh, great. So uh, my background in, in the university was actually agri-economics. So I had passion about uh, farming and about changing how, uh, what the output is for the farmer, because I remember those days in university, when you plant, you, you get very poor quality output, and fertilizer is at the uh, edge of this. With fertilizer, you can actually improve your output and your production. I remember those, uh, when I was sent to, uh, during my NYC days, I was actually- For those who aren't familiar, NYC is the National Youth yeah, Service. Sure. Okay. So I was actually posted to serve in a secondary school. I still had that burning passion in me that I would still go into the agri sector, uh, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. But fortunately for me, the NYC uh, state coordinator, without uh, any conversation from me, uh, they put me out of that school and sent me to the Fertilizer Producers and Supplier Association of Nigeria. I mean, this is where I had a burning passion from. But fortunately enough, they pulled me out from the from that secondary school, and they sent me to FEPSA to do my uh, my youth service there. And since then, it has been fertilizer all the way. Wow, I don't know many people who are that excited for that many years about fertilizer, but I think it's amazing that through your work and some of what we've seen while working on program with you yeah. is you really get to learn an exchange between different African countries but yeah. you you know you're familiar with what happens in Kenya and Ghana what makes Nigeria's fertilizer sector different what makes Nigeria's fertilizer market different from other African countries okay so for Nigeria Nigeria is one of the largest markets in Africa and it's also one of the dynamic markets in Africa uh, you have a lot of uh, because it's so large so you have a lot of differences a lot of uh, uniqueness in Nigeria. I think, for instance, the urea production, you have a lot of urea production now. So, and actually, let's pause. What is urea? Okay, so urea is the nitrogenous fertilizer that uh, the plant needs for top dressing that enables the plant to grow. So, when you have uh, the plant have the uh, basic uh, nutrient requirement, which is the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So urea produces 46% of nitrogen to the plant. That's why urea is uniquely applied to the plant for top dressing. Talk a little bit more about why urea is special in Nigeria. Oh, okay, so Nigeria currently has a natural gas that is used in production of urea. So um, the industry in Nigeria, the production industry in Nigeria is expanding, rapidly growing. Uh, before now, we had just 500,000 metric ton capacity to produce urea. 
for as we speak now, we're having close to 6 million metric ton capacity, uh, putting into consideration Dan Bote and Notore all now live on stream. So you have Dan Bote, Notore, and uh, Indorama. So these companies are uh, basically uh, producers of urea, so they convert the natural gas into urea production, and they often target some specific markets in Africa and outside Africa for export too. What are there other things that make Nigeria's market particularly unique or particularly challenging? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you look at uh, the policies in Nigeria, sometimes they tend to make the Nigerian market unique. Now, take for instance, Nigeria is one of the, uh, I think, the only country where you have prohibition of importing NPK. So you can't bring in NPK. Whatsoever NPK you find in the Nigerian market has to be locally produced. So, I mean, this is a very unique feature in Nigeria. But this uh, creates a sort of, uh, it makes your cost builder analysis different and unique from other countries. Because for other countries, they can just run it direct from imports or for Nigeria, you have to run it through production process because you can no longer import NPK directly. It, it has to be captured under the local production. So what a cost chain builder is, is uh, trying to look at all the costs that are involved in the production, transportation, and the end sales of fertilizer from point of production to end of uh, to So basically you want to understand the cost from start to finish. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So to shift a little bit, a big part of the program has been helping to understand, trying to understand what stakeholders need and how they want to be able to use data on the default dashboard for Nigeria. Can you talk a little bit about what you hope stakeholders will take away um, from using the dashboard? Stakeholders will be taken away basically will be the ability to have data for planning. Before now, there haven't been sufficient data for planning. Most people just plan randomly and blindly. They're just planning based on some time hearsay, some time prediction. But now you have this data that you can use for planning. But for the private stakeholders, I know they are definitely interested in seeing what's the quantity of uh, your quantity of fertilizer being consumed this year, Will it be the same next year? They look at the trend. Nigeria has a pattern when you consume now, you consume uh, the following year, and the third year it kind of drops. It's usually what they are going to be looking at, and that's what they are going to be used to plan efficiently their production. So they don't overproduce. But when you overproduce sometimes, you have it lying down in your warehouses, you are trying to prevent it. Because uh, fertilizer itself, it's a product that is hygroscopic, so it absorbs water, it absorbs moisture, so it is not properly stored. So you now have the hassle of trying to keep it properly. So there's need for planning, so you know when to produce, what quantity to produce, and or how not to underproduce at the same time. What graphics do you think will be most popular? The, the bar chart of the aquarium consumption, that will be most popular because that is what most of their interest will be uh, what is the quantity of fertilizer being consumed? Before now, we don't even have this data. This is the data, I remember in 2011, we, you need to go around all the ministry and go around half of the private sector offices before you can even come up with uh, an estimated apparent consumption. But now, with the VIFA dashboard, you can act this at the click of your finger every single year. I mean, this is a, this is a real shift from where we're coming from. So much of what happens behind the scenes, the data that is used on the dashboard comes from somewhere. Yeah. So actually, can you talk a little bit about the Fertilizer Technical Working Group and what role that plays okay. in getting the data that is on okay. the dashboard? So uh, before we uh, we calculate our brand consumption, we need to actually validate some figures because it is not enough for you to uh, go to custom, go to uh, port authority, go to the producers, and then just put this figure together. So you need to actually validate this figure, that this figure is agreeable by all the sector players. So the Fertilizer Technical Working Group, it's a group that is put together by IFDC with the help of other partners to uh, bring together the private and the public sector together in one room 
to validate some of the statistics every year. Yeah. And so we share data, and then we put this data together in such a way that we can calculate apparent consumption. Apparent consumption, which is production plus import minus export minus non fertilizer use. This is the best estimate for uh, real consumption. Because as it is, real consumption has a lot of parameters that you need to put into consideration, which we might not necessarily have for now. Uh, parameters like what's the quantity of carryover stock in all the agro dealership shop. Carryover stock yeah. being what's left over. What's from left the over, season. yeah, from the previous year. But apparent consumption just puts into consideration what is being what is estimated to be consumed for that year. So this group sits down in a two, three day program and then we look at each and individual line of import, export, production, and uh, sometimes distribution. And then we we'll put up and we agree, we we'll put up a figure and this figure is agreeable by all the stakeholders as the validated uh, uh, estimated consumption, which we call current consumption. I wanted to highlight that is because it's no, it's no small feat for you, Sam, to have heard the cats from all over sure. Nigeria to get these numbers. Sure. Um, but it's nice to see, it's part of why we think that the dashboard is so powerful because yeah. it helps to reveal all this work that you've been doing for years behind the scenes to collect and share these numbers. So now that the dashboard is ready to go live and it's yeah. done and has all of these graphics in place, how is that changing your strategy or how has that changed your strategy for Afro in terms of your next plans to keep improving um, fertilizer and data and fertilizer more generally. Yeah. So now with the VIFA dashboard going live, we know that for sure there will be much more demand, much more request uh, in, fertil in uh, data quality, uh, data availability, much more uh, some other uh, component that needs to be, to be captured. Yeah. A lot of things, there are a lot of new data, yeah, new data points that will really come into play. So this has tremendously helped AFO. The VFAR dashboard has tremendously helped AFO and brought AFO into the spotlight that most of these information that were kept before can now be visibly seen by everybody. It's no longer Excel sheets. So this is gradually changing AFO, making AFO uh, expand its data capturing methodologies. One of the things that's come out of this is that it's helped you make even more targeted requests to particular yeah. private sector companies sure. for additional data to improve the data points that you have. Sure. So one of the things that you've developed is a non-disclosure agreement yeah. to help give companies comfort that their data yeah. is being protected. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about how that process came about and how it's helping you improve? We knew that there will be a likelihood of more data requests. Now, with more data requests, we needed our uh, data suppliers, which who are the private and some of the public organization, to be comfortable with sharing data with us. So we don't want an issue where they're not comfortable sharing data with us, and now we have the Viva dashboard, we need data to feed this dashboard, and then we're stuck in a place. So that's why we needed a non-disclosure agreement with the private sector, who are the key data providers. This data comes from the sector. So we can only just collate this data together and present it. With this NDA, the private sector is much more confident and comfortable in providing granular data to us without any fear that this data will be used against them. This is why the NDA is really, really important to us. And this NDA, we believe, will open more doors into data sharing with the private sector. Absolutely. I think you highlighted it really well. It's an issue of trust. Yeah, sure. It's not just important to have the data, but people have to believe that they can trust in it, that exactly. they can reuse it, that it'll be reused carefully. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see how you've navigated that. What do you think are some of the trends for anybody who's curious about Nigeria, or specifically Nigeria's agricultural sector and how it's growing? What are some trends that people need to be watching for? For a couple of, uh, for let's say a year or two now, you can see that the trend is gradually shifting into local production. I'll be seeing the Nigerian fertilizer market shifting from basically imports from just some few years back to a point where it's now adjusting to export. I wouldn't be surprised to see that Nigeria is exporting NPK in the nearby future because already Nigeria is already exporting urea. Nigeria is one of the 
largest exporter of urea in Africa. So this is a shift I'm expecting, and I'm also expecting that because of the volume of local production that we're now having, because of the number of players in the local space that are now actively producing, I'll be, uh, uh, you will be seeing a shift into special blends. That's a blend that will be for soil specific purposes. Uh, maize blends, uh, rice blends, and then it's for specific soil. Special blends are important because they take into consideration the soil uh, uh, nutrients that are already available. Now, if you do a blanket blend, let's say like 15, 15, 15, there might be a lot of phosphorus already in that soil. Why do you need to add more phosphorus to it? But with special blend, you have your soil test and everything, and then this enables you to get specific things that the soil require, or get specific things that the crop require. Let's say for uh, maize or vegetable or for other things, they might not necessarily need the same quantity of nitrogen. And then once you just give them the same quantity of nitrogen, you're actually killing, you're actually reducing your output. If you have a special blend that's especially tailored towards the need of that crop, you have maximum output. You, you have, for one hectare, you can have as much, we know other countries that have six uh, tons per hectare. Why was this problem with one ton per hectare? I mean, these are some of the issues that we're having as we're just using direct application of fertilizer, not tailored specifically for a purpose. Interesting. And how do you think more data or data for planning can help shift or change that? Put the uh, data from uh, QED, uh, you can see and know a specific region that plants a specific crop. Now, for a blender, he is equipped with this information and then he knows what to produce, he knows what market to target, and then he's going to try to outsmart the other blender. Bear in mind that when you have a lot of local production, competition sets in, and when this competition sets in, everybody will be looking for to create a fertilizer that will be much more, uh, what I say, productive to the farmer. So if uh, a farmer is producing maize, take for instance, and a blender has information that this section of the country produces maize. He is going to his drawing book to look for a blend that will outperform every other blend in the market. And once that blend is successfully approved by the farmers, and that they can attest to it that this blend produced uh, performs more to me than the other uh, blanket blends the farmer will be forced to start buying his own blend. And this is where the planning comes in. And then he starts planning for that market. He starts planning in with cognizant to what is going on in the market, what is currently consumed, what quantity can I supply the market, what was the quantity consumed last year, was everything exhausted, what is the price? I mean, these are all the parameters he's looking at to uh, make sure that he's putting out the yeah, 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 sure. Um, so ultimately, Sam, thank you so much for your time. Thanks thank for letting you. me ask you 50, 50 million questions. Thank you, bro. Um, it was such a pleasure. So if we want to learn more about um, AFO, AfricaFertilizer.org, where, where can we find more information? Okay, so uh, you can go to the uh, website, which is AfricaFertilizer.org. Uh, once you go to that website, it pulls uh, out all the information about African Fertilizer, about our data, about uh, what we do, about some of the programs. I mean, it's a, it's a whole package on the website. And then on the DG side, if you want to learn more about the VFA program or you want to learn more about Development Gateway and what we do more broadly with data and technology, you can find us at www.developmentgateway.org. And we have a whole section of our blog that talks about VFA. So if you're curious about Kenya and or Ghana, and there's tons of resources around some of the cool things we've done there as well.